So, Robert, would you, I'll call the meeting to order and would you please uh, do it? Yes. Uh, Chair Walker? Chair? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill Widmer will not be here today. Excuse. Okay. Great. Uh, are there any? And uh, so is is the Zoom on? Did you say we have a member on Zoom? I don't see. I don't see. I can't see him. Oh. No, no, I understand. Okay, well, welcome, Steve, even though I can't see you. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, get, are there any public comments at this time? Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, we will move to the regular agenda items. The first is review and approval of the draft minutes of November 14th. Um, do we have any corrections or additions? Move that they be approved. Excellent, that was my next question. <laughs> May I have a second? Okay, all in favor, I have minutes are approved unanimously, thank you. Uh, let's see. Why? Oh, so then back to the agenda. Uh, well, our next item requires that uh, we have a person here to make a presentation, which I think. No, that's Kate. Okay. Well, uh, welcome, Kate. Uh, so, Robert, since we, since our presenter for the for Inside Asset Management Investment is not here yet, um, shall we move to item three? Yes. Yes, thank you. That was going to be. <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good. Yeah, why don't you come sit at the table? Are we expecting George or should we take him? I'm good. How are you doing? Um, so you're just uh, just in time. We were we're just yeah. getting to that. Line. <laughs> we'll give you a moment to get settled. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Robert will be bringing in Dodgers hat. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Oh, there you go. Best friend's a Cubs fan, so he would have. Uh, so do you want to please introduce our guest, oh, Robert? Yes. That'd be great. Um, thank you, Chair uh, Walker. We have uh, Dave Whitholm. He's our Senior um, Portfolio Manager for Insight Investment. Um, I, I submitted uh, in the staff report, um, I'm going to do a review of the Town Investment Program with Insight um, Investments. Um, it's going to provide a November program review you have in your uh, packets and provide an outlook of the economy, market environment, and latest interest rate strategy from um, Federal Reserve. Uh, staff also returns at the end of our presentation the um, in, uh, investment policy for review uh, by the Finance Committee um, to, to ensure the consistency with the overall investment objectives of, the, of preserving capital principal, liquidity, yield, and consistency with our overall investment objectives. Um, uh, this does not constitute any changes for the policy, just bringing it back for review. A uh, quick summary, uh, the total investment portfolio is at about 16.1 million, um, and we have an additional 12.4 million in lay in our operating account of 904,000. For total approximate cash and investment in hand as of November 2023, of 29.4 million. Um, again, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. He's going to provide a, a review of the uh, investments for the year and where the, the town, and then he'll go and discuss in detail 
um, our current investment avenues that we have within our investment policy and just kind of open it up for questions after that. Yes. Is it the same as the one we got in our packet? It is. Excellent. Okay. I'm better in hard copies. <laughs> I was doing the same thing over at uh, Menlo Park. So uh -huh. I, was, <laughs> I thought it was, you know, I'm like, it's only 10 minutes away. <laughs> Better than Russ. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, that was off the record. No, no, no. <laughs> and for those that aren't familiar with Insight, because it's a, a name you probably wouldn't hear on, on the retail basis, we do almost 100% uh, uh, institutional investing. We're part of Bank of New York, hmm. which is the seventh biggest bank and the oldest bank in the country started by alexander hamilton so we're excited about that but uh mellon bought them out. well <laughs> we bought mellon out oh, bought mellon. but i'm from pittsburgh yeah. so we can say mellon bought them out <laughs> <laughs> originally so um yeah I, I let's i start on page five with the two yield curves and i always like to start here because it kind of gives us a little bit of perspective um, and uh, this is a yield curve from the end of 2022 and also the end of 2023. And you can see we ended the 2023 almost exactly the same place as we started. Uh, we ended 2022. And, and just to give you an idea of what a yield curve is, is we just simply graph the different maturities along the bottom, three month, six month, one year, out to 10 year. And we say, what, what kind of yields are they paying for? And this is a treasury yield curve. So it would be like looking at treasuries. And um, you can see short-term rates are high, but they're expected to drop. So what's happening in the marketplace, short-term rates are, uh, this in yield curve is what we call inverted, which means the short-term rates are higher than long. That means that the market is anticipating re rates to come down in the future. So right now, uh, at, at the time, at the end of, on 1231 23, um, the two year was paying 425. Uh, I, I will tell you that it's gone up a little bit today. As I was walking in here, it was paying 437. That's a little bit higher, but it has dropped even at 425. That's 35 basis points or th about you know, three, 35 one hundredths of 1%, a basis point is one hundredth of 1%. So 1% hundred basis points. So it's about 35 basis points or about a third of a percent lower than it was a month ago. So it's already started to drop. Uh, rates peaked out um, probably around early December, um, right after they started to drop, right after the Federal Reserve chairman came out and said that they're probably done raising interest rates and are very likely to start considering dropping interest rates going forward um, because they're concerned that these high level of interest rates, they've raised interest rates about since the pandemic, it's come up about 5% in the overnight rate. And that was done to slow the economy and to, uh, to reduce inflation. And it's been relatively successful. So let's talk a little bit more about that. But two years down 35 basis points. The five year just in the last month is down 30 basis points. And the 10 year is down about 22 basis points or about a quarter of a percent. So rates have already started to drop. The market always moves in anticipation of the Fed, Federal Reserve moving sometime later in the year. But the market moves much more quickly. Um, and lets the Federal Reserve catch up with it. And that's very likely to happen. So if we move on to page seven. Here, Madam Chair, we have a I'm question. Sorry. In oh, I'm sorry. Public. Yes, we have a question. Bob, please. Yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, it depends on which part of the yield curve you're looking at, but I can tell you in the last month, it's gone down 30 basis points, but at the high, you're absolutely right. At the high, that two year was paying 517. So 
if you're looking at say 530, 437 today, uh, that's 70-80 basis points from the absolute high. 35 in the last month. So seems to me like it's at the lower end of the two of that point. I, I bought a bunch of treasuries just to catch the top of the chart. Yeah, great. I mean that's the yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We had the cash to flip. We did. Now, keep in mind you had you had the building program going on in, in twenty twenty two and we we kept relatively short because we weren't quite sure how much money you were gonna need for the building program. But in twenty twenty three we started to really extend the maturities out of the portfolio and make it longer. And we did buy a lot of securities, not all over five percent, but some in the high fours too. So all in that period. Now, the difference is some of the ones paying over 5% were relatively short term. And we actually want to lock those in for a little bit longer term because your short term money is going to be covered by the amount of money that you have in late fall. Wow, they went over. Late is high. 3.93 for the month of December. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and it's fluctuated. Yeah, it does fluctuate. So late fit. Correct. Yeah. Right. And back in 2009 or 2008, before the recession, LAFE was close to almost 5%. Then LAFE was, was nothing. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to put some of that money and put it into 59 month treasuries or short term 5% of those. Yeah, it could probably work out. It depends on what your cash flows are, right? If you need the money in LAFE and you've got to have it for that liquidity purposes, then you got to have it in LAFE at a little bit lower rate of return. If you don't, then putting it out into some short-term ladder treasuries might work too. But I leave that decision yeah. more up to Robert as to what his cash flows are, you know, because he knows those infinitely better than I do. I really don't know. So... Going back on page seven on, on that employment and the labor market, clearly the employment market has been coming down. This is what we call non-farm payroll. That's the number of new jobs added every month. And that's the bar chart. And the line is the six month moving average. So you can see that six month moving average has been coming down. And it's coming down not only in 22, very significantly, but also in 23. I will note though, in the last couple of months, the non-farm payroll numbers, that's the number of new jobs added to the economy for that month, uh, has been actually coming up. In October, they added 150,000 new jobs. In November, 1.99. And in December, 216,000. So it's kind of creeping up a little bit in the last couple of months. So the employment's been running relatively strong. In order to replace the number of workers and the number of new people entering the uh, the economy, you only need about 80,000 uh, new jobs per month. And so having it around 200,000 is good. That's showing very, what's that? This is nationwide data, that's right. <clears throat> These are all new jobs, that's right. So this is all new jobs. So uh, the unemployment rate was 3.9% in October, dropped down to 3.7% in November, and remained at 3.7% in December. That's low near the all-time low, which I think was about 3.5%. That's an all-time low in unemployment rate. That's a 50-year low. So employment's still relatively strong, even though it's slowing slightly and has How been. How do they know I know they do it by survey. So they ask, they do a survey and they do it. I, I, I'm not all privy to the numbers of how they put the numbers together, but it's the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics puts it together. Correct. 
this one in this case. And remember, um, the, the, is that right? The, no kidding. I didn't know that. That's how they get, that's, that's how they get responses. <laughs> Okay, I, I that's something I didn't know. I know they did this by survey, but I didn't know who they were surveying. And I actually never talked to anyone that they actually had ever surveyed. And they can't survey every town in, in the no, country. I think they just it's a sampling, right? Okay. Wow, okay, interesting. I mean, I, I learned something about the survey today too. So, um, look, I you know one of the things we talk about on page eight is um, uh, no, I just skipped over it. it. It's just more of a summary page. Yeah, it's more of a summary summary page for Q three, and it's getting old because it's now past Q four. Um, in page eight, so as long as people are employed, they still have real disposable income and they still are consuming. And in fact, the consumer confidence came out the, uh, last week and it jumped from 102 to 110, which is the biggest jump that we've had in, uh, two years. Um, and so that's really rather significant. So if these consumers are still employed and they're still very confident, so they're still spending money and that still keeps GDP rolling. So GDP in the third quarter was running at a 5% growth rate. Now, when you hear that, you, let me put it in context for you. The 10 year average before the pandemic started in 2019 was 2% per year growth rate for GDP. So that's the trend line. So the third quarter was running at 5%. The estimates on the fourth quarter, it's not coming out, but it's gonna come out in the next week or two, is running at two and a half percent. Now, when you hear that, they'll say, wow, it's down half of what it was in the third quarter, but it's still above the trend line. The trend line's 2%. So when you're running at two and a half percent, you're still running a pretty solid GDP. Uh, and, and just to give you an idea, last, Bloomberg did a survey last November, not this past November, but November 22. They surveyed all the leading economists. 97% of the leading economists said that there was, in 2023, there was going to be a recession within the next 12 months when they did the survey in, in 2020. The economy didn't slow down, it accelerated. And it, it's not slowing down, it's slowing down from the third quarter to the fourth quarter, but it's still looking relatively strong. Uh, this year, when they did the survey, about two thirds, only a third of the economists expected a recession and two thirds, some people just won't give up the ghost. And then two thirds are expecting what they call a soft landing, which is that the economy will slow a little bit less than the 2% trend level, but, it will not go into recession. And that's where our economist is. I tend to be a little bit more optimistic in that. I think the economy looks relatively strong. It looks relatively strong in the fourth quarter and looks like it's going to be relatively strong for 2024. So that's my thought. But interest rates will continue to come down because the Federal Reserve, <clears throat> as Chairman Powell stated in, in December, is thinking that interest rates are too high and that they may be starting to threaten the economy and it may go into recession. So they're going to start to dial these higher interest rates back eventually this year. Now, can I ask a quick question? Sure. What is the definition for purposes of this chart of real disposable income? It's probably on a page. I just... <laughs> uh, well, and um, <clears throat> that's, their in, that's income adjusted for inflation. So real income is income adjusted for inflation. There's a lot of people say, well, okay, my income went up 3% last year. You must be doing great. Well, if inflation's running at 5%, you actually lost 2%, right? So that's real, it's disposable income adjusted for inflation. 
In, is, do, you, do you know, is the data then on the income, does that generally come from federal tax returns, do you think? Or So another, I'm just, what I'm thinking of is, is I'm going back to my law school days from of the, taxation, no, no. ordinary income versus capital gains. It comes from the Bureau of Economic, Economic Analysis. analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Which it comes from the, again, it's the federal government measuring um, what people's wages are. They probably do look yeah. at the tax returns and other stuff too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And wages too. Yeah. As they come in the tax returns and, and, uh, and people's pay slips. So one of the other things was, so I talked about inflation. So we talked about real adjusted, real incomes adjusted for inflation. How's inflation doing? That's on page nine. We look at, I like to look at PCE, personal consumption expenditures, um, which is the measure that the Federal Reserve uses the most. And you have regular PCE, and then you have what we call core PCE, which is to take out food and energy because they're the two most volatile components. And the rest of the country knows that energy costs have been coming down. Now, you don't see it as much here in California. I just had my niece out from San Diego, out in Colorado. I mean, I bought gas the other day at 248. So, you know, I know. And that's, they were, they were really like good. looking at that. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's true. Um, so, you know, it, it, it it's uh, energy prices have been coming down. So let me talk to you about PCE. In September, PCE was running at 3.4%. In October, it was running at 3, 3%. In November, it was running at 2.8%. Keep in mind, the Federal Reserve's target is 2%. So we're moving very, very close to where the Federal Reserve's target is. Even the core numbers, which take out food and energy, and energy has been coming down, getting cheaper. Uh, in September, is running at 3.7, October running at 3.5, and November running at 3.3%. So coming down about not quite a quarter of a percent per month. So 0.2% per month. So extrapolate that out for the next year, it could drop another two and a half percent if it was dropping at that pace. One would think it would slow down as it gets closer to that 2% level. So inflation's coming down. Um, and in fact, core PCE, if you measure it not over, these are year over year numbers, if you measure it for just the last six months, is already running at under 2%. So it has some influence of the latter six months on that. So the current PCE, if it runs at this level for another six months, is going to be below the Fed's target. So it's going to get right very, very close to where the Fed wants it to be. That's why they feel like they can stop, start backing off on interest rates. They've in raised interest rates 5%. They can start backing that off. And that's really what the projections are on page nine. Now, right now, the Federal Reserve is only estimating, and that's the light green line, that interest rates will come down about three quarters of a percent. That would be 325 basis point moves. The market is anticipating it coming off one and a half percent. So almost twice that much. So that's a big change. Um, will the market adjust backwards towards the, what the Fed is doing or will the Fed pick up its pace and actually meet where the market is? Uh, those are the unknowns. But interest rates are going to drop next year. Whether they drop 100 basis points or 150 basis points is a little bit hard to tell. But a lot of that drop is going to take place in the very short end of the of the yield curve. Um, and the longer end will probably be a little more stable. So therefore, we've been buying out securities out a little bit longer in order to lock rates in at this top of this peak of this cycle. We've been doing that in the fall. We're probably going to continue to do that in the spring, locking in a little bit longer rates at these little higher levels. Um, the last slide on page 11 is really just about uh, mortgages and homes. I always wonder, I mean, the 30-year mortgage is now down to 7%. It was at 8%. It's dropped 50 basis points in the last month. Um, you know, if it continues to drop, that again is economic stimulus for the for the 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 GDP. 
you know, because what happens is home transactions are all time low in the last year. That's all time low. So, um, well, I, I don't know if it's all time, but it's like the last 20 or 30 year low. We can't go back to 1900. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're right. So, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it, within my purview of doing this, it's a low. Why? Well, no one wants to get rid of their seller house, get rid of their 3% mortgage and do a buy another house and get an 8% mortgage, right? No one wants to do that. So everyone with the 3% mortgages, which we got over the last eight years, nine years, <laughs> is now saying to themselves, hey, I'll wait. I'll wait till interest rates start to come down. But when it does come down, you're going to start to see a pickup in activity. Uh, whether it's people downsizing or people wanting to upsize their houses, um, you're going to get a lot more turnover in houses as interest rates and mortgage rates come down. And that That's, is very good for the town of Atherton because a major portion of our income comes from real property tax. From real property tax, yes. And it's good It's good for GDP, too, because what do people do? They buy a new home. Ah, the curtains aren't right. Ah, we got to get a new washer and dryer, you know. Oh, I don't like this dishwasher. We're going to take that out. We're going to put this in. You know, so people that creates economic activity and that sales tax and that's revenue coming in. So um, that will be stimulative to the economy as well, which is also why I think the economy is going to be relatively strong. Let's look at performance for a moment. How are we versus the one to three year treasury benchmark, which is the benchmark we use? Uh, for the portfolio, well, we beat the benchmark in the last one, two, three, four years. We didn't beat it in 2019, but we beat it in the last four years. Now, unfortunately, 20 and 20, 21 and 22, the benchmark was negative, and so were we. So um, that's we weren't as bad as the benchmark, but we weren't as negative as the benchmark, which is, means that, and again, this year we're positive over the benchmark. So, um, and yeah, we were way under the benchmark. In like 2022, look how much we were half of the negative performance. Why? Some of that was just the fact that you guys were short and we were keeping the portfolio short. Why were we doing that? Because you were still finishing up on the construction and stuff. And we didn't know how much of that money we could start moving out longer term. We started moving money out longer term in 2023 because we were past the construction phase and Robert felt comfortable that we probably need, could start moving out. And we started buying longer term bonds, which was good because a lot of those bonds we put into the portfolio are, were paying um, sort of in that uh, um, four and, you know, four plus area. Yeah, well, Think about it in 20, in 2020, the two year paid 20 basis points, one quarter of 1%. Okay. But nah. So it was, it was tough. I mean, but now interest rates are back up. We don't think we're gonna get down to that low interest rate level again. In fact, we think late rates are gonna go down, but they're gonna settle in more in that sort of uh, two and a half to three percent area for two years, and um, and and I think that is going to be healthier for the income overall for the portfolio. It's going to go back to more normal environment. We've been in an abnormal environment since, well, almost since the Great Financial Crisis, yes, two thousand nine, two thousand nine, right. Then we went down to very low rates, and then we slowly came back up. And then we went into the pandemic, and we went down in rates again. And now we're back up more, I think, in a normal level. If we don't go into some kind of a war, or if we don't go into some sort of economic crisis. But things look good right now. So the suggestion of moving more funds out of LAFE into some of these sh shorter treasuries probably makes some sense. Um, and also filtering in some longer term securities helps as well because um, the short ones will go away when interest rates start to drop over the next year. 
Uh, we just did in um, December, right? December and in part of January. No, this is as of November. Start, starting to. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, you, you know, we, we just went to that. We went from that long peak from, you know, our last revenue that we receive is May, June. We went from May, June, all the way till the end of December. Yeah. Nothing. You know, so now we're got to We'll get some more starting um, April, May, exactly. June. Yeah. So we're we're riding. We're in that cycle where now it's coming in. Um. So. Yeah. Even on some short term stuff, if we only did stuff that was in the six six month area, lock in a little bit better for le than life for a while. You're absolutely right. That's absolutely correct. And let, let's go on to the uh, let's go on to uh, the asset allocation. Let's scoop skip over there. Okay, that's the asset. Oh, there we are. The asset allocation. One more. No, right, right there, right there. And uh, there's another screen right behind you. Um, well, we've got 29% in corporates. We always try to keep your, your max is 30%. So you can't go any further than that. But probably have more like 50% in agencies. Uh, and we and the rest in treasures with the government bonds. That's forty percent right now. Um, and the reason why we're so much higher in treasuries was exactly that point, because a lot of the agencies are not. We don't want to buy callable bonds at this point. If we buy callable bonds when we're at the top of the interest rate cycle, what will happen? They'll get called away when interest rates go lower. That's what the call feature is there for. They can get them back from us. So we want to do that. So. What happens is these agencies, knowing that they can call them back, they issue callable bonds so they can get the money back and reissue at a lower rate. So, and, or they all, they do adjustable rate securities and they're doing a lot of floating rate securities right now too. So, but we don't want those because we think interest rates are going to down. Why don't we want them to floats down? So what we really want is what we call bullet securities or non-callable securities, non-floating securities. Who's the biggest issuer of them? The Treasury, the U.S. Treasury. And so we're buying disproportionately more Treasuries right now than we are buying agencies. Uh, yes? On, on this uh, chart, it shows the weighted average duration. Yes. 1.4. Yes. I mean, that's the key measure of uh, interest rate, interest rate risk or yes. reward. Yes. Uh, are we moving towards a different target? Trying to make it longer. We're trying to get it up to the benchmark, by the way. So this portfolio was short, so we're making it longer. We're at 1.4 now. It's a little bit longer than that now as we speak today because this is as of November. We're trying to get it out to some – I'd like to get it at least to 1.8 years. Ideally, I'd like to get it to two years. Most of the portfolios that I have that are running against the one to three benchmark are running towards that two-year mark a little bit longer. So we're a half a year shorter. So adding some funds from LAFE could actually supplement some of that weighted average maturity and make it a little bit longer. Why do I want to make it? If 1.8 years on the one to three uh, benchmark is the neutral number, it's 1.8 years. We're a little short. I'd like to get it a little longer than the benchmark. It doesn't, I know, when you look at 1.4 years, 1.8 years, you know, two years, it, it, it will make a difference over time. So if we make it a little bit longer, it sure would help. It was just at Menlo Park. Theirs is getting, there's about 1.9 years right now. We just bought a bunch of securities for them, longer securities to lock those rates in, to bump that duration up. Well, we can't go any longer by, than five years by statute. So we were buying in that three to four year range. 
Yeah. By statute. Yeah. By statute, we can't go more than five years. But so when we say long, it's not like personal investing where you're buying like 10 years. This is like governmental investing. So I, I'm sorry, I, I forget to translate it sometimes. Long to us is like three or four years. Because neutral is about two and a half to three years. So when we get out sort of in that three plus area, that's getting, that's longer bonds for us. In fact, if we go down the next page, Robert, you can see the distribution. You can see we have been buying sort of out in that area. Got a bunch of money coming up. So what we really need to do is as those mature, throw them back out into sort of that three to four year range. Because really, we have a high concentration in the two to three year area, and that's the stuff we've been buying over the last year. But we need to take some of the short term funds that we've got coming up. We got about 30% of the portfolio coming up in the next 90 days. Of course, that was as in November, and we did, we've already done already some of that. Right. So, and what we were doing was buying more in that three and four year area. Yes, as a matter of policy, do you always allow everything to mature rather than selling? Generally, that's true. Not always. If we have a corporate and there's a corporate problem, sometimes we'll sell it prior to maturity if it's going to get a downgrade. And we don't like that. Um, the only thing, the only reason we would sell some short, sometimes if we think interest rates are going to drop very quickly, we might sell some of these bonds come and do in the next month or two, even though we could have waited to them to mature in the next month or two. But interest rates, if they're eminently supposed, think we're thinking they're going to drop very quickly, we might sell them, take a loss, and then buy bonds before they drop because it would make more sense. You have to have strong conviction to do that, right? I was going to say, it makes more sense if you're right. Right. Yeah. It, it makes a lot of, it makes absolute sense if you're right, but you know, it's a guess. So typically, yes, we let them ride to maturity and that's generally our policy. Um, we, it's hard, <laughs> you know, this <laughs> guessing is hard, especially if it's about the future. So what we always say, uh, so. got some inside information. <laughs> I'd love to have inside information, <laughs> um, I, I, especially if it was material. Um, but yes, it's a guess, you know? And sometimes we guess, we've done it. I won't say we haven't done that in the past. There was in 2018, we did that. And we did it with almost, almost all of our portfolios. We, we talked to people say, hey, look, we really think interest rates are gonna really start to drop. We're getting very close here. We really think we ought to sell the bonds for the next couple of months. At that time, they were they were just at very small losses, maybe less than a thousand dollars. I'm like, let's sell these. We're going to lock. It. it worked out. That was one of the times we did it, but that was five years ago. So I won't say that we never do it, but it's rare that we do it because it's it's too hard to guess in the timing. It's just too hard. If we'd have done. Put it this way, if we'd have done it in, we could have done that in December and it would have worked out great, but we didn't do it because it was a big guess. And we just didn't know quite what the Federal Reserve, we didn't know that the Federal Reserve Chairman in December at the meeting was gonna come out and pivot his policy. I mean, no one really expected that. That was a huge surprise there. So, we eventually thought he was going to change policy, but we didn't expect it at the December meeting, and that was a that was a big change. And we, I mean, you know, no one's we didn't see it coming. Does he try to avoid doing that? He tries to avoid doing it, but he was definitely sending a clear signal. He was sending a signal that we're shifting. You know, they call it the pivot, but we're shifting policy. Um, he. Because he could have he could have not said anything, which is what everyone expected him to do. You know, no one expected him to say anything, and he came out and telegraphed that he was clearly shifting policy from 
basically we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We may go out and keep these here at these levels for an extended period of time, but we're concerned about the fact that these higher rates are going to be a drag on the economy and we don't want to go into recession. And he, he just basically said that and he, said, and he followed it up in the press conference with more. He didn't just say it, you know, I mean, it was, it was pretty clear. So, Well, you got to remember that two-year treasury is, uh, that's a spot rate. So your portfolio is built with term securities over a period of time. That all we're doing on that two-year treasury is the same, what's the monthly average? So it's essentially a spot rate. It goes up fast um, when r rates are rising, but look back in 2020, 21 and 22, where it went down so fast. When it goes now that it's flipping around, you're right. Because we lag on the way up, we'll lag on the way down to exactly the other side. That's our intention is to, now that the rates have gone up and as they have, um, investing and getting, capturing that interest. Where before, I mean, the last 10 years, we haven't had that luxury of. Yeah, well. Not being as, they, were low for a long time. They were really low for a long time after the pandemic or after the great financial crisis. And they slowly, slowly rose them up into 2018, beat them, and then moderated a little bit in 19. And then, you know, when the pandemic started, it just went to zero I mean, instantly. Um, now, portfolio didn't go to zero instantly, as you pointed out, because it still had term securities in it that were rolling off. But when they rolled off, we didn't have any place else to go. So we didn't go long, tried not to go too long term with it. We tried to stay short during the pandemic, which is great for which you work out. you're building the building anyway, yeah. right? So the, during that time, you're building the building, you needed cash anyhow. We weren't locked in um, at the low rates and then locked in for years and then oh the rates are higher so we weren't we weren't at a loss because yeah all them but then you know just like themselves silicon valley bank or all these banks they they took the losses because they needed the cash we did buy some callable securities at the bottom of the interest rate cycle and those of course didn't get called away because the coupons were so low you know but they gave us a little more return at that point but we certainly don't want to buy callables now, even though they're giving us, they're trying to entice us with a little more return on callables now because they know that eventually if they get called away, their total cost would be much lower. Yeah, so when bankers going down, this is not like a nice piece of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, um, it had the highest growth a lot of it's callable, yeah. A lot of it's callable, but the other part, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac haven't been issuing, they're shrinking their balance sheet, so they're not issuing as many securities. So you only have home loan banks out there and really farm credits. Um, so to get some uh, um, Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's into the portfolio, it's been hard. Is just we we see them occasionally. Someone sell in them, and uh, sometimes we'll buy them when some you know we see them out there. But um, it's it's rare. That's why we have a disproportionate amount of treasury. Typically, in the normal environment, we'd only have we've got forty percent treasuries now. We'd only have twenty percent treasuries, and we probably have fifty percent uh, agencies. Um, but they're just really not available for us. I'm sure there's an easy answer to this, but I heard earlier that we had a lot of cash right now. In but, late. But late. This is, okay, well that's, yeah, yeah. That That's just the timing issue on that, on this particular report. We okay. bought we bought a security over, it's an, it's, and it's an accounting issue. 
So we bought a security over month end because GASB, Governmental Accounting Standards Board, requires us to show it on the report as of the day we did the trade, not as the day we did the settlement. The cash moves on the settlement date, not on the trade date. Okay, so but in, it shows up as a negative on here because it shows as if on the report, the security is actually in your holdings report as if you already owned it, but you didn't really. Technically, you owned it because we did the trade. trade. But it didn't settle. settled until the next month. <clears throat> in December, it all unwinds itself. And you're not by statute. We are not by statute allowed by preferred. And at any point, because it would be, that would be an, it, we have a whole group that does nothing but preferreds and convertibles. Um, and, uh, and they have some success, but we can't use them for public sector portfolios anywhere in the country, actually, except for in, in their retirement portfolios. I, I'll caveat that. We do that retirement work, but I work strictly on the operating side. Um, um, there's another point. Oh, and this cash position here, that's only the cash position in the custodial account. That doesn't include your cash position at your bank or, or at late, which is essentially a money market fund. So this, this 16.1 million is just investments, um, with our, uh, just it's your term piece separate. Um, so this report does not include late. Sorry, everybody else knows. What is LAFE? Well, LAFE um, is, it's short for Local Agency Investment Fund. We use LAFE, um, a lot of agencies uh, use LAFE. Availability is, is, you know, from one day to the next, you know, like we could get money wired from our LAFE account to our operating account. Um, local, what they call a local government investment pool, only for local governments. So it's a basically managed similar to a money market fund, but not exactly, because it doesn't follow the SEC 2A7 rules. It, had, it tends to be a very short-term bond fund. The only thing that makes it stable is the fact that it's sponsored by the state of California, which has the last position in it, and they've got the largest holding. So if you take your money out, you'll get a, a theoretically, hundred cents on the dollar because any last loss would be remain with the state of California. But it's a, it's a little different. But that's in the, correct. <laughs> and, and do we have complete control over when we withdraw from that and move it somewhere else? Faith, we do, okay. we do, um, and and um, it, and it, it's the tre the state treasurer oversees it, and so we we have control over life. It's more uh, liquid, uh, money sits in there, because you know we want to let our investment portfolio ride. So life is whenever we need money, it comes from the life, and so we would withdraw from that. This is as of November thirtieth. We received our money late December, so correct. We have about that. In a sense, it is. I mean, <laughs> well, I don't know what your cash flows are. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it is, and I think a lot of it too is because, other than you know, you have our operations, we have capital projects that we're we're kind of kind of lining up, but you know. Putting more into the investments is, is great. More on the investment side, uh, taking advantage of not just the LAF, but some out of the LAF, the liquidity, and putting in long, long year, longer years. Um, there's also, keep in mind that within a portfolio, shoot down another um, slide there, Robin. Is there, uh, no, no, up to that bar chart, yeah. The portfolio, even though it has a one and a half year weighted average maturity or duration, it's 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 somewhat lab. I mean, you know, 
we've got mature, we've got liquidity in there. There's things coming out. There's there's some liquidity. If it was laddered a little bit better, and it's typically laddered a little bit better, but this is skewed a little bit um, in that we've got 30% of the portfolio coming off in the next 90 days. Some of that, as we said, we've already moved out into that three and four or five year area. So we wanted to get a normal, more of a normal distribution. <laughs> you know, it's higher around that two to three year area and lower on the tails. And that would be typical. But my point is, even a term portfolio has liquidity into it. So if you take some funds out of your overnight money market, distribute it out over the term portfolio, if you need to take it back, it's not like it's locked in there. When it comes maturity or something's coming up, we can move it back out and put it from one to the other. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, particularly the treasuries and the agency figures are very low. Corporates, you, there's there's more transaction costs, some more bid offer spread on corporates. But we like corporates in the portfolio. Robert's always like, well, can't we just buy another corporate? I'm like, no, no, no we're, we we're, can't buy because we're 30%. Yeah, we're limited yeah. on that. There's only so many corporates you can buy. That's the rule. So, um, and that's by both policy and by state statute. So, um now when rates get lower we might add some more commercial paper but commercial paper is relatively short term so it's not helping us lock those rates in because it spins out so a quick question about um on the corporate bonds I, you mentioned that typically you try not to buy callables when interest rates are looking to come down, but we got Wells Fargo yes. at a 5.45 rate and it's going to be callable uh, next month. Yes. Exception to that rule are corporates because a lot of corporates are callable and you'll note that they're callable like one month before maturity or three months before maturity. So you get a three or four year bond, but they give themselves some flexibility as to when they can call that, but it's usually not callable. Like we don't buy a three-year bond or a four-year bond and it's callable in six months, which is which the agencies are. I mean, they'd be callable next quarter. You can buy it and it'll go away in three months. These, you're gonna hold it for the majority of that period. And we always put on our returns is either what we call the yield to worst. So it's either yield to maturity or yield to call, depending on which is worse. Got it. We build that assumption in there. And 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 for the past, anything that's in this investment pool or fund that we have here, when it matures, we reinvest. We don't, you know, our policy is to keep it in there. We don't. Take yeah. money. We took money. Yeah. But other other than that, before the town center project, everything that was in here would stay in here and get reinvested. So that that's what we were doing. But now, you know, the opportunity is is you know if there's the, the late availability, we can push more more money into this account with the intention that it will just stay in there, stay in there, um, until one day we say, oh, okay, we need that cash. Let's not keep it in there. Let's pull it back to our operation. Emergency reserve. We can. We typically don't because of the illiquidity. You know, you can't get. At times they have, but typically not to the to treasuries and agencies. Yeah, absolutely. But typically not to corporate. So we'll, as a substitute for CDs, we pick up that corporate section. Yes, but they're not as liquid as a treasury. You can't sell it at any time. Yeah. And again, the, the problem on the 250 limit, that's great on more personal investment, but if you're trying to invest $5 million, you know, that's, that's a lot. 
it's like 20 yeah. different banks. Yeah, it's 20 different banks that you really have to, and then theoretically, we've got to maintain, we, we remain paying credit on about what, four or five banks for you guys that we watch, but then it would be like 20 banks, you know, that we, because we don't want to do it and not monitor the credits, even though we're covered under the FDIC so, insurance. Yeah, we'll be Well, but the bank bonds, we're monitoring those credits continuously. Any any corporate we have in the portfolio, we monitor those credits. That's where we, previously with the corporates, we were at one point AA plus only on the corporates to, because there was not that many that were that rated that high. We moved it down back in 2018 to A rated. Um, just, just because at that time, the triple A. I great financial crisis. Most of the, a lot of the triple A's went away. Double A's went away. A lot of people are running at single A credits now. Well, because, mostly because of the drop in the interest rates. When the interest rates dropped, most corporations switched more to uh, debt financing rather than using the equity market because the equity market became more expensive and bonds became cheaper because the interest rates were so low. So they switched their ratio from equity financing to debt financing, which lowered their credit ratings, but made them more profitable. Higher leverage. Are there any other questions, including from um, anyone on Zoom? Uh, is is that the end? Are you still going? I, I'm I'm done. I'm done with my part of the presentation. Okay, okay. I, I just I didn't want to cut you no, off. No, I, 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 <laughs> there any other questions that I can tell you? But I I think this is an opportune time to start thinking about moving some cash out of shorter portfolios into the longer portfolio if your cash flow analysis allows that. It's something that we've been encouraging actually all of our public entities to do. I, I did have one question. What are your investment management fees and uh, are all these returns net of fees? All these returns are gross of fees and our fees are, Robert, you might have to help me with that. Probably. It's, it's, yeah, it's a percentage of the total portfolio. One mm -hmm. tenth of one percent. Yeah, you're looking at it from the, from the other side, I yeah. guess. Um, we're looking from it from the investment management side, not the from the I write these checks. You're right. <laughs> and and you know on the corporate bonds, I mean we have a couple in, in, in here that are that are gonna be rolling off that are paying like Yeah. So find so another one. This is we're running bonds are rolling off paying three quarters of a percent and we're reinvesting them now at 4%. So that's good. We we'd like my personal preference is that interest rates wouldn't go down. I'd rather see them stay higher for longer because that allows more of those securities to roll out of all of our portfolios, all the portfolios that we manage um, because they're in there somewhere. Um, during the pandemic, we bought. So, and, you know, tried to buy shorter bonds, and as they roll out of the portfolios now, it's great because, you know, we're getting four times the interest earnings. Yeah, I, I'd like to see it get enough closer to the two-year mark um, 
I will say the years is a little shorter because we started that way. Shorter. Yeah, but now Five, three to four better. years. Last year we've been getting it longer and longer and longer. Another thing is just the investment policy. Dave, because it's the policy that we have, um, Dave and then what well, we're not. Uh, if, uh, other than that, is just going over the investment policy in my staff report. I just listed that you know. Main objectives is is you know, preservation of capital, protection of our investments, maintenance of the liquidity um, to meet our needs, and um, our main types of instruments that we just talked about are, are the U.S. Treasuries, federal instrument instru instrumentality, medium term notes, and LAF. Um, there are other opportunities. Mm -hmm. In our policy. There are some uh, other investments you you want to minutes that are in statute that aren't necessarily in the policy. Um, one statutory change was to allow you to go out and have more than used to be limited to twenty percent for mortgage backed securities. Um, we don't have any it's not in the policy right now. That also includes asset-backed securities. Um, asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities are securities that are backed by residential mortgages. Um, it's basically the cause of the great financial crisis, right? You know, if you saw the movie, the big short or whatever, that's what it was all about. And um, we don't have any of those in the portfolio. Statute allows you to do that. They just broadened the statute out. Used to be limited to 20%. Now it's unlimited. Um, to us, they don't make a lot of sense in a short-term operating portfolio. Um, Asset-backed securities are a twist on mortgage-backed securities rather than the securities being backed by mortgages. They're backed by credit cards or, 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 or auto loans. So... There's more of a default risk than there actually is in the mortgage section um, because people apparently stop paying their credit cards before they stop paying their mortgages or paying on their bank loans before they stop paying on their mortgages. Um, however, during the great financial crisis, a lot of the asset-backed securities did very, very well because they're over collateralized. So they don't just have like, you know, 100% collateral, they have like 120% collateral. So they <laughs> throw the bad payers out. Institution with good payers back into the securities. How well did they do the AAA rate? Did they do well in the great financial crisis? The asset back ones actually did very, very well. Um, but as a result of them doing very, very well, the spreads all tightened up. So we used to be able to get 150 basis points over treasuries to go into these asset-backed securities, and now you can get 20 basis points. Well, to us, it's is it really worth the credit risk to go in and only get paid 20 basis points more? So we haven't put those in the policy. Um, the other thing that is in the policy that's or in the statute that's not in the policy is what they call supranationals. So just like we have our own federal agencies governments gather together and they issue supranational bonds. So there's like the Asian Development Bank. There's the Latin American Development Bank, which is a collection of 20 or 30 governments that come together, do this aid funding, um, and they're AAA rated. They're much like agencies. Difference though is they may pay you four or five basis points more than a regular federal agency. However, they're less liquid. So if you ever did need to sell them, that little four or five basis point premium that you're getting is a liquidity premium because you can't sell them as quickly. 
um, again, AAA rated. We haven't put those in the portfolio either. This is more of a straight portfolio of treasuries, agencies, high-grade corporate bonds. We haven't done a lot of fancy stuff. We Do we do that stuff in other parts of the company, our company? Absolutely. I struggle with it in an operating portfolio because a lot of it's kind of gimmicky, quite frankly. You don't make a lot more money and you take either less, they're either less liquid or you're taking on more credit risk. That's why I don't like them in the portfolios. You can't say that we're not doing them in any part of any portfolio here in California, because we are, but in general, by what I call, you know, more straight vanilla portfolios, we try to stick with the basics. And if you get your cash flows right, you know, how much money you need to keep liquid, how much money you can put in term investments, that will make you more money and more return than doing all these gimmicks with little things. It will. Get your cash flows right. Invest long when it's the top of the market. Invest short when it's at the bottom of the, in the bottom of the interest rate cycle. That'll make you more money over time than tweaking all these other little things that make you four basis points here, three basis points there. That's why we have Robert. <laughs> I mean, the the it, the managing the you know the money. I mean, it, it's you know, we've averaged around thirty million um, for the town. Good position where nobody expected interest rates to be so long. I mean, so low for ten years. That's never happened. Um, and now we're at the other end of the spectrum where they've gone up, and they thought, oh, they're going to raise the rates and it's going to shock everybody. And it hasn't. And to some extent, it has, but it hasn't to what they thought it would be like overnight. Um, and so we're at a good thing for me is just ensuring that you know liquidity and the availability of funds is there because as you projects and more operations, you know, costs are starting to go up. Um and understanding how that will manage it affects our cash flow. Um good, but um I think we have the opportunity now that we haven't had in the last 10 years is take advantage of the higher interest rates. Uh, you did finance some of the building, didn't you? What do you finance at? at but barely below 2%, like 1.9, 1.8. I mean, and we have a... Free money. <laughs> it is literally free right. money. Yeah, and we did it at a time when, during the pandemic. It was in the middle of the pan pandemic just started. There was the uncertainty of, oh, banks don't want to lend money. You don't know what's going on. And so we were on that uh, end of the spectrum, like, oh my gosh, are we going to get financing? And and we ended up doing a private um, funding lease back with Capital One Bank, and uh, we got that. But there was a lot of agencies that were in the avenue of, of doing that, and banks were pulling out. Banks were like, "We don't know if we want to do this or not." So there was that hindrance there, and we did it at that time. And it, it was free money, one point nine percent. It was for ten years. There's a callable um, option on it. The council wanted a, a five year callable. Two years from now, 2025, to call it, um, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to do it because it's free money and uh, we're going to and we're making the payments. And so it, it went through at that time, you know, it was a lot of stress is like, what's what are we, you know, what's happening? Banks aren't going to do anything. Are they just holding the money? And here we have, you know, the U.S. government did the whole funding you know for everything and all that so um yeah I, I think we're in a good position going forward and you know we're starting to take advantage of um of, of these interest rates and i think we're, we're caught up in these short-term uh rates for a long time like other banks have been and they needed the cash and they took major hits for it we weren't so now we're at that that avenue I see a great funding room, great funding room of funding that at that level. Consider every dollar that you pay back, 
yeah, it's at 2%, but inflation is running 2.5%. So you're paying it back in inflated dollars, I mean, essentially. The only thing is probably, you know, instead of doing the minimum, we could have done more. <laughs> right <laughs> and at that time we we're like no we just want to do what we need cash flow wise and we did do that but when you look back retrospect if you're like oh my gosh we could have done the 20 million you know and and, and done more things and all that but i mean or, or higher i mean we went eight they are um it's uh I, I think inflation going forward is going to be higher than that 2% going forward. I think that the period of free money, we may have seen the, it could have been the period for our lifetime of low of interest rates and the low of, and, and I mean, I started in this business and double digit inflation back in the early eighties. And uh, now I, I don't think we're going to go back to that, but we're going to go through, I think, a period of higher inflation. I, I do. I think this cycle is going to go down and it's going to go back. I remember selling three year farm credits paid 13 basis point, uh, 13%. I mean, I was just like, why wouldn't you buy this? <laughs> this guy was like, nah, I gotta buy it. It's gonna go up higher. But it's, you know, it was like the top, but two years farm credit. It's it in the last 12 years. Yeah. And never. That's very possible unless we go into some kind of a crisis situation, which, which we only seem like we're one moment away from another Am crisis. Am I right Sorry. that this is an average of all of those? numbers with implicitly including the size of the state yeah yeah that's weighted average that's, that's right that's average. a weighted average yeah okay. weighted of average of the duration on the side yes that's exactly it um, um other than that other than I just wanted to present to the committee the the investment policy staff recommends that there's no changes to the policy but we wanted to talk to um if, you know if there's other avenues add to the uh, investment avenues to add to the policy that there are. But again, staff is just um, recommend. Are there, are there um, any desires on the committee to suggest changes? I, there's certainly none from my direction. I, I'm, I'm hearing what Dave's saying that, you know, we're good as is, and he told us some opportunities where we could expand it, but frankly, I'm not convinced we should do that. But I, I'm open to any other suggestions. I tend to be a little more willing to take risk. Um, Put turn on your mic, please, Molly. I'm willing to take a little more risk, uh, but it sounds like the government regulations around us <laughs> really limit how you can take risk. I, I agree. If it's a long-term portfolio, I, in Florida, they have more room in the statute, and we have some equity positions in, in, in some of those portfolios, just a small equity position in there, and so they have some room, but it's not in the, it's not in the California statutes to do it. The, things, the, the other things that we can do, quite frankly, it's a risk-return trade-off. I like to I like get a little more return. I'm not so sure it's worth the hassle um, in some of those areas. I, I'd love for them to do preferred. I think that would be a great area. Um, or even if you could do convertibles, that's it's complicated, but um, it can be successful. But it's it's not a permitted. The only place I know it's ever permitted is in Florida. Yeah, and, and there is a little risk, but you know, for a piece of the portfolio, maybe it was five percent or ten percent, it would be I think that's a that's a legitimate long term and that's what they do 
in Florida with the equity position. I mean, got them indexed in an index, and um, but it's only three percent of the portfolio. But it's a long term. It's a long term building growth type of thing. However, no permeso for California. Yeah. <laughs> So it sounds like we are not recommending any substantive changes. Um, Robert, I do have, since I, every year when you send this out, I read it carefully, and and I, there are a couple of very minor typographical kind of things that I'll I can give to you before it goes to the, does the council reapprove it every year? Um, the count, if there's changes, if but, there's change, I, but I, I can definitely, yeah, I would take yeah. that. Um, so uh, then I guess I would ask for a motion that we, recommend to the council that there be no substantive changes to the investment policy. Um, can I have a motion? Thank, or should, did I, I guess I made the motion. You <laughs> second, okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dave. My pleasure, always it's nice a, to see you. Thank it's you. A very informative. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, was, it was tough not being able to go out and see everyone during the pandemic and now I'm just getting back out. Seems to be by obviously there's changes on the council and that sort of thing, but uh, it's nice to be able to go out and see people one on one. So thank you for coming. Uh, you're thank you're very you informed. Oh, thank appreciate you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, that's just a function of having done it for forty years. <laughs> he was during he moved to New York right before the pandemic, so was there throughout the pandemic and. Uh, from Colorado and just moved back to Colorado last year, right? I'm in Colorado. Oh. Uh, it, was, it was nice to get out of New York. I mean, it was just, uh, I, but they asked me to come back to the main office for a while. So, and uh, now I'm, I'm glad to be back in Colorado. Most of my kids are in Colorado, so. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's nicer. And certainly, a lot less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, taxes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Taxes well, are tough. thanks again, My Dave. Pleasure. And Thank now, you guys for having me. We will uh, move on to our next item, item three, receive, review, and file information reporting only on the CalPER <laughs> stakeholder engagement briefing, yada, yada, yada. So. <laughs> gotten that robert why don't you <laughs> tell you, us the important okay. things that we should take away from this well i i um I, thank you for for introducing the item uh this is just the information uh from from the finance and administration committee that went before the um calpers board uh and and this took place at our pre during our time when we had our uh, actuary review um at our other at our november meeting and so just wanted to bring this to the count the committee's um Attention, just for additional information review, there's things that we had talked about um, when we were dealing with the actual RA, but, you know, the, the funded status uh, of, of the plans have decreased, and, and a lot of that was because of the 2021 uh, investment returns that we had discussed, um, negative um, 7%, and and then um, in 22, but 21, we had the, double, the triple digit uh, increase. In investments and then the changes of the asset allocation um, and the changes of uh, due to the reduction of the uh, rate of return from 7% to 6.8%. So uh, th th this report touches uh, from, this is from Calper, CalPERS actuary to the CalPERS board um, outlining, you know, the, their, what they envision on the sustainability of the portfolio and the different investment scenarios if things were to happen. So I, I, I saw this, um, I try to attend these meetings um, remotely um, when I can, or I get the information. And I, I just thought that, you know, from our discussion with our actuary, that this is just a great information that, you know, we're aware of this information. We, we're, I think we're more highly involved in it as a, as a committee and, and as a town council as well. But just sharing this information that the actuary is aware of this, is communicating it to the CalPERS board and, and just wanted to get this information out to you. Uh, this, um, as further, uh, you know, in uh, updating our dialogue with CalPERS, uh, my intention is still to have hopefully someone from the uh, the investment side, we had the actuary, hopefully somebody from the investment side um, that we can um, have visit the committee um, hopefully this year. 
uh, bring forth also any investment information. Um, there's also a, the investment side that also provides updates to the CalPERS board. So I'll provide that as well to the committee, but this is just based on the actuary and just the outlook. So it's good information. Um, please read it. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, but I, I think it, it answers what we've been asking. Um, it's reiterated in here what they're aware of, what they're looking for. Yeah, thank you, Robert. I, I mean, I, I thought it was really helpful and kind of uh, coalescing everything that we've been told by CalPERS, but especially having a, a, a right. nice little PowerPoint. At the end is the PowerPoint um, kind of, of this drive report. It home. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just thought I would send it to the committee. You know, it's, it's, it was, you know, something we've been reviewing. Um, it had valid points in there. And, and uh, as we're, we're, ten, we're, we're trying to understand uh, the the pension and the status and what we're doing. And we're doing a lot of these things that uh, they recommended, you know, we've contributed an ADP um, to our, our public safety fund. And, and you know, there's cycle, right, of the investment returns, but, um, you know, in the long term, uh, it's sustainable, but um, doing the things that they can to mitigate those risks. And then in here also, there's that non-investment risks uh, that are in here, uh, which is the mortality rates and all that. So it kind of discusses what, what's happening in the last couple of years and what they anticipate to see. One of the things I'd like to point out is too, is since the COVID pandemic, you know, obviously the mortality rate has changed, but the retirement, um, it, it, the early retirements of people that weren't reti weren't anticipating retire, retired during the pandemic and after. So that added to some of the adjustments in the plan and the funded status of it. So it was interesting to see this, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to give this to the committee. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll continue the dialogue. Uh, like I said, with the. It is, and and correct, and it, and it does talk about that um, page. I think twenty five of this of the report talks about that volatility um, of the plan. I think eighteen five of this report um, talks about that, and and you know where where we are as a plan. Are we more of a um, uh, what's the word <laughs> aged? plan as far as it's if we have more retirees than actives um it discusses that so uh and we're one of those that yeah we don't have that many actives uh, on the number of retirees but the other side of it is is everybody is that pepra you'll see in here in this report it talks about pepra so in 2013 beginning january 2013 calpers um created a sec a separate segment of calpers members so anybody that was hired after January 1st, 2013 is part of a PEPRA. Anybody hired before that is called the classic member. So um, the PEPRA is now 10 years old and you're starting to see that it's, it's, it's shifting. So more people that join um, the CalPERS system now, not classic members, it, they're PEPRA members, they're new members. And the PEPRA, PEPRA membership has lower, um, a lower pension uh, payment, and uh, and the employee employee shares more of the cost, so it's almost like a 50, 50, 50 split between um, two employees in the Calper system. So, you know, ten years ago, there was like, oh, this is going to take effect. You know, this is going to help solve the the issue with with Calper's uh, pension fund. Well, 10 years now, it's start, you're starting to see it because you're starting to see more members that are new members, PEPRA members, and the ones that are retiring are the classic members, those that have the higher pension um, benefits. So um, so it was good to see that in this report, they're starting to show. And I think in the report, it said that between four and five billion was saved from the implementation of this new class, PEPRA, the classic to PEPRA membership. So it's good to see that. Thank, thank goodness they've finally yeah 
it's starting. <laughs> we're starting to see the, 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 you know, it takes time, right? So 10 years, 10 more years, it'll be 20 years into this thing. And you'll see the less of the classic members will be retired or be nearing retired. I, I want to do classic. Yes, I'm a classic. <laughs> Thankfully, by Thanks, a couple Tom, years before. A, a, yes. oh, I just, I wanted to thank you also for sharing this. It, what it helped, it helped me understand how it works. And because it, it helped me understand the sort of built in lags, uh, you know, what is going to happen in the future. All the statistics they gave were like for entire pools. I, I just wanted to confirm what my understanding has been that we're part of a pooled investment, but everything else in terms of our liabilities, just just us, it doesn't matter what's happening, except I guess mortality assumptions or something or system-wide, but with individuals, it makes no difference. And with individual other municipalities, whether they're underfunded or not, doesn't affect us. Doesn't affect us. We're, we're responsible for our portion of retirees in that have passed through here um, by the years of service. And that's built into the actuary. But we're just pull, put in a pool plan. I think majority of the CalPERS, everybody's in a different pool plan. I, don't, I think there's not that many that are individuals. And I think the ones that are individuals are the huge, huge cities that, that, that have their own individuals. And obviously the benefits differ, you know, some are at 2% at 55, some are at 2.7 at 55, some are the different range of the plan. So every every um, agency uh, have different plan specifics. Um, and so, yeah, so pool plan, we're, we're responsible only for what we can, what has passed through, like who's passed through. And then I had one other question. Does this, in terms of, uh, our share of the investment pool or, and returns on it. Does it work more or less like a mutual fund does in that when, when you make a payment to them on that day, you're more or less buying it at net asset value. And then when benefits are paid out of it, it's like a distribution at net asset value on that day. Or is this only measured once a quarter or how does that work? It's the way it when we're paying into it, it's it's kind of mutual fund, but the the payment of it is whatever the, the liability, right? What is owed, um, has grown, right? Whether it's gr whether it's had a negative effect, growth or yeah, that's the liability side. But I was just just in terms of the balance of our investments. The balance of our investments are based off like, of that interest like rate it, and rate of return that the the plan that occurs at that measurement of time. And usually it's the end of that fiscal year is at the end of the fiscal year is when they say the investment rate of return was 8% at the end of June 30th, 2022. That's their measurement date. Okay. So... Are we buying in at a daily net asset value? I mean, obviously they have a lot of investments that aren't going to change value day to day, but or are but on the other hand, they have a lot of investments that do change daily. So like does it make a difference whether you make a payment this Monday or two weeks from this Monday? Or no. no? Yeah, it, it it I mean, we're paying it now because it's basically it's their um, like we're funding at the end of, at the, we're funding, um, the investment. Yeah. Yeah. But the way we're funding though, the, yeah, it is, but we're, the, we're paying today and it's getting, in, it's getting pulled into the pension. Um, and it, it, it has its cycle. Yeah. A UAO we pay at the beginning of the fiscal year to get a discount. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get they'll get us a, a, a service charge, correct. 
Um, we have the option. So agencies have the option. One, pay up front, or you could pay monthly. Monthly is the full value. If you pay ahead of time at the beginning of every year, it, you get a discount on it. And we will always pay it at the beginning. The buyer UAL payment, it's invoiced, and we select, we'll pay it up front. Other agencies pay it much that UAL. Other component is the normal cost, which is a factor of payroll. So every payroll, every biweekly, we have a uh, we have a, our normal cost that we have to pay for the employer side and the employer. Mm -hmm. That goes to CalPERS. They take it, they invest it, they build on, um, they build up the years of service or the month of service. They accumulate that. And it goes into the pool. Um, at the end of the, the fiscal year, then they say, okay, the fund made, they meet, they met the investment rate of return or they didn't. And then that's where the actuary comes in and they calculate the gains and losses for us. But it, it, it is a great question. And I think the investment and then the actuary It it sounds like if if we're if going forward you're going to try to get a representative from Calpers on the investment side it'd be a yeah. great question to ask right them. so I'm sure they I mean I suspect it's it's either very simple or very complicated I, I and in other words I I'm not sure we can analogize it to uh, you know to a uh, like if we're paying it now is it ten dollars now you know. Yeah, it's, you know, if you knew exactly how it worked, if it doesn't work on a daily net asset value basis, then you have some opportunity to gain the system, I think. I I, gain the system. I don't think it's daily. I think it's um, either it's, it's the end of each month, each reporting period. Um, because the way it, on the normal cost, so it's earned but agencies have 10 days after a payroll cycle to pay that earned um, normal contribution in your retirement. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there's a lag in there and how they, I think they calculate it, but um, agencies need to pay it within 10 days once the pay period ends, or then you start getting fines or there's delays or there's, uh, you know, you get backlog. So, um, yeah, that, that. Well, I, that dovetails nicely into the, the topic number four, which was I wanted to solicit suggestions for future committee no, and I'll do <laughs> topics. That. And I think that's definitely yeah. one. Uh, are there any other ideas from committee members of things you'd like to have us discuss at future meeting? Because, as you know, if it's not on the agenda, we can't discuss it. So <laughs> trying to think ahead here. <laughs> I would like. Turn your mic on, please. I, I would like to understand better how the finance group works with George, and what what the uh, how the system works within the government here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, as far as we, it, it's it's. You know, it's 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 a multitude of things. It's verifying that we have daily operations. You know, we have to have cash on hand to pay our operations. Pay invoices every week. Uh, George and I review them. We sign off on them. We sign off on checks. We look at, uh, you know, capital projects stuff. Review that. See, um, you know. Our department expenses, you know, departments are, you know, meeting their their budgets, that type of thing. But a lot of it's treasury, it's daily accounts payable, it's payroll, making sure that you file all our taxes on time. A lot of it's to just, um, you know, research on grants and projects. So it's, it's, it's daily normal operations, but at the same time, it's outlook, board outlook on, uh, on our operations, on projects that need to be. Good 
So just just out of curiosity, on a on a normal work week, you know, do you usually speak to George every day, every other day? I have no concept. Uh, I, every day. I mean, there's there's I things there's there's yeah every day, uh, emails. You know, there's just correspondence. Working in tandem, not just with us with the city manager's department, but also us with public works, making sure public works um, gets in there. You know, if they have to purchase something or they're working on something, they get in their bids. You know, I have three bids. This is the lowest bid for the vendor we're going to use. And then we have to create a PO. I, I sign off on the POs. George reviews the uh, signs off on that. And from that, I know that, oh, okay, George reviewed it. You've seen it. I And yeah, this is a, they followed all the, you know, the Police department, making sure the police department's in. cars that are being towed. No, we're, I guess. I'm internal and external external building department, our planning department, working with them, um, you know, on our fees, making sure that those fees are being charged. Uh, they do a plan review, uh, you know. They're following the protocols where they have to make purchases and stuff, so. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a lot of collaboration, a lot of teamwork. Uh, and, and a lot of times when you look at it, other cities have major, I mean, they're, they're major, they're big departments. And we're in a small city like this. But it's a lot of people are involved in a lot of things because you don't have the resources. You know, our biggest department in the town is our police department. They're the biggest part of our budget. But, you know, they have 30, 30 uh, staff members. Uh, and so at 24 7. So. A private citizen here, I'd be very curious as to what the budget is for each of the departments. And I've been on here for uh, a year. I've never seen that. Oh, we do. We do. No, we, we do see yeah. it at least once a year. Yeah. Um, not it's not in this. Yeah, in it, I I can picture in my brain. <laughs> yeah, the page, page page by page. Yeah, the budget, budget versus yeah. actual. I'll I'll bring that I'll bring that the next um in, in the March so you can see that. Um, I think it's usually only once a year for us. I'm assuming the council looks at it very often. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'll 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 email it. Yeah, I have an online version, so I'll send that to you. But in, in you March, finish for the whole committee yeah, just yes. because it's nice to have it online instead of a, go back to our yeah. copy. <laughs> this year, we I made a. It was all online. Um, I have missed. It. And then we'll review. Uh, Yeah, in March, usually, usually our March meeting, I'll, I'll, I will bring forth the beginning of our budget. So you can see that uh, as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so our next meeting is in March, Tuesday, March 12th, 2 p.m here as usual and um is there a motion to adjourn thanks second all in favor say aye aye any opposed motion carries we are adjourned <laughs>